Thanks a lot. Uh, please be seated. I open this public meeting of the Collegio van Decanen van the Vrije Universiteit with this photon, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. We are really happy, really happy to celebrate today the collaboration of our Faculty of Humanities with Professor Manon Perry, who has accepted the Chair of Medical History by special appointment for the Stichting Historia Medicinae. We welcome the board of this foundation that aims to stimulate and to strengthen teaching and research in medical history. We really appreciate the decision of the foundation to establish the chair at VU. And of course, I'm very well aware by welcoming the board that the board is now following us on the live stream. And I want to welcome everybody who is following us on the live stream to celebrate this event. We are very well aware that people cannot come to the VU today because of the corona measures and the warnings. So we thank those who could make it uh, and we welcome everyone who now online follows this academic meeting via the live stream. Special welcome also for the two members of the curatorium of the chair who are here. Let me briefly introduce Manon Perry. She is a historian and an exhibition curator specializing in the uses of humanities for health and well-being. The position of Professor Co of Medical History at VU is part-time. She also is a senior lecturer in American Studies and Public History at the UVA. And prior to that, she was curator in the History of Medicine Division of the National Library of Medicine in Washington. This is a unique combination of historical expertise with respect to health and medical humanities, public history, and exhibition practices. And it fits perfectly well within the profile of our Faculty of Humanities, which is always looking for what we call the plus of humanities. We are deeply invested in research and teaching on how humanities approaches to technology, politics, society, the environment, and culture help understanding the world we live in and are an essential contribution to envisioning sustainable futures. This plus of humanities approach is already convincingly illustrated with just two examples that provide a brief insight into Manon Perry's scientific career. She graduated as a Master of Science at the University of Manchester, UK on the thesis Beauty and the Breast mastectomy and the social, surgical and technological reconstruction of femininity. Whereas her PhD thesis from 2010, University of Maryland, USA, dealt with broadcasting birth control, family planning and mass media, 1914-1984. And my final example of the close connection between Manon Perry's research interests and our humanities profile is the Comenius Teaching Fellowship, which was awarded to Perry in 2019, and it deals with embodied and object-based learning in medical and health humanities. The title of that project summarizes the focus of Manon Perry's research and teaching. So, Professor Perry, we are extremely grateful to have you with us, and I now would like to hand over to you for your inaugural lecture on being human, the contemporary relevance of medical heritage. Floor is yours. Thank you. In 2019, the Welcome Collection, 
a museum and library in London, derived from the profits from Burroughs Wellcome Pharmaceutical Company, opened their new permanent exhibition on contemporary medicine, titled Being Human. The exhibition marks a new era in Wellcome's approach. Like their previous projects, art is included alongside historical artifacts, and medical issues are explored in ways that will appeal to a broad audience. Being Human goes further than previous exhibitions, though. By combining music, smells, touch, and various media, bringing in different senses as well as a range of materials to express the interplay of social and cultural as well as biological dimensions of health and illness. The epidemic jukebox shown here features songs related to disease from music that just addresses the topic, including He's Behind You, He's Got Swine Flu by British artist The Streets, to songs produced specifically to slow the spread of an epidemic such as Ebola in Town, created by Liberian music producers to share health information and to challenge myths about the disease. Nearby, exhibition visitors can rub a bronze sculpture, shown here on the left, by artist Tasha Marks, to release a familiar smell that signals the action of a beneficial bacteria. The smell evokes breast milk, and the sculpture is intended to celebrate its role in nourishing the bacteria in a baby's stomach that contributes to the development of their microbiome. As well as an array of body fluids featured in the exhibition and the range of senses engaged, the breadth of issues addressed also extends Wellcome's usual scope to include climate change and the impact of discrimination alongside infectious diseases and mental health. Refugee astronaut, shown here on the right, by British Nigerian artist Yinka Shonibare is a space traveler he describes as a post-apocalyptic figure with his worldly possessions on his back, seeking conflict-free and environmentally clean greener pastures. While close by, in one of my favorite pieces, a film by a collective of Danish artists known as Superflex shows a McDonald's fast food restaurant slowly filling with water. The gently rising tide in the symbol of consumerism reminds the viewer of the causes and consequences of the developing climate emergency. In striking contrast to their previous long-term exhibition on contemporary medicine, Being Human challenges the medical model of disability, which emphasizes bodily difference or impairment and prioritizes its cure. The exhibition illustrates how people with disabilities have challenged this model to instead highlight how society's attitudes, infrastructure, and policies are often far more disabling. The gallery is light and spacious with high ceilings, a wall of windows, and a warm wooden floor. The entire space is designed to be accessible to visitors with a range of disabilities and welcoming to diverse groups of different ages and backgrounds. This new approach reflects a wider shift underway in medical museums across Europe, as these institutions attract rising numbers of visitors and accommodate new audiences. Medical heritage collected centuries ago is now being redisplayed in novel ways and for a variety of new purposes. But controversies surrounding body worlds, the plastinated anatomical exhibitions that debuted in 1995, have made some medical museum staff cautious about the materials they show and wary of potential backlash. Over the last four years of research, I've encountered diverging opinions on the usefulness of historical medical collections for general audiences, as well as concerns about objects and exhibitions that may do more harm than good, perhaps risking audience well-being or damaging the public image of scientific expertise. In what follows, I explore three key questions that have been raised. Who are medical museums for? What should they collect? And what can be shown? I argue that medical heritage remains highly relevant for medical professionals as well as for others, even as it calls into question some of the paradigms of the past. The provocative nature of much of this material is part of its appeal, offering opportunities to reconsider the lessons of history, its ongoing legacies, and the health challenges of the future. Medical museums first flourished in the 18th century, intended primarily for the education of doctors and situated within universities with access only for staff 
and students. Popular anatomical shows also displayed medical materials in commercial traveling exhibitions open to the public for a fee. Although these were marketed as scientifically informative, they courted controversy and drew in crowds of curious visitors by focusing on salacious and gruesome topics. Displays commonly featured wax models of genitalia illustrating the ravages of venereal disease and gory depictions of surgical amputations. One of the most popular items commonly shown was a full-size female nude figure known as an anatomical Venus who could be dissected by removing pieces right down to the fetus in her womb. Although they were most successful in the 19th century, some popular anatomical exhibitions were still on tour as late as the 1970s. Medical school museums were intended to be a much more scientific project, although their collections reveal overlapping interests with their more popular counterparts. Alongside surgical instruments and diagnostic tools, for example, they also exhibited the anatomical Venus, as well as artistically creative arrangements of human remains. Surviving collections typically include additional curiosities, saved not for their educational or scientific value, but because of the fascination of the original collector, from tumors with teeth to arts and crafts made with human hair, bone, or skin. While there are few remaining traces of the original popular exhibitions, many university collections still exist across Europe. As departments moved or hospital wards closed down, curators of campus museums have accumulated discarded objects, ranging from everyday items such as patient beds to the records or research tools of an esteemed former staff member. Departments of anatomy and pathology often retain shelves and cupboards full of instruments, models, or specimens which are no longer used in medical education. Over the last 15 years, many of these collections, once intended only for the expert gaze of medical practitioners or students in training, have been opened up to a broader audience. At the same time, public museums for the history of science, technology, and medicine have also enjoyed increasing interest and rising visitor numbers. The last few years have seen an especially productive period, including renovations of major museums in Austria, Italy, the UK, and here in the Netherlands, where the redesigned Rijksmuseum Bohava won the award for European Museum of the Year in 2019. There are also entirely new institutions showcasing historical medical collections, such as the Ghent University Museum, the first of its kind in Flanders, which just opened. The appeal to a broader audience beyond medical specialists has meant reconsidering traditional modes of display and the perspectives usually presented. Museums of the history of psychiatry were the first in the field to reimagine how their collections could be interpreted to engage broad audiences including visitors who are highly critical of medicine's approach to mental illness. The history of mental health care presented in many of these venues focuses on abuses in the past, as well as ongoing debates over the positive and negative aspects of diagnosis and treatment. In recent years, the trend has accelerated, with several leading museums no longer defining themselves as repositories of the history of psychiatry, but now taking a wider approach to mental health as it's explored in science, society, and culture. Broadening their interpretive framework beyond the practitioner perspective and the medical model, the Bethlehem Museum in the UK was the first to rebrand as a museum of the mind in 2015, joined soon after by the dollhouse in the Netherlands. In 2019, the Dr. Hislane Museum in Ghent reopened with a redesigned historical exhibition that shifts away from the iconic objects in the history of institutional care that were formerly on display. The new exhibition draws more heavily on contemporary art, addressing key themes, notably classification and power and powerlessness, alongside an extensive collection of work produced by people living in psychiatric facilities or with lived experience of mental illness. Exhibiting the history of psychiatry is complicated by the portrayal of mental illness and mental health care in popular culture and the news media, including terrifying depictions of punishment and restraint in dirty and dangerous asylums and exaggerated portrayals of mental illness as a danger to society. 
while some of these representations are derived from a real and difficult history, such as the incarceration and mistreatment of vulnerable people, they also mythologize certain practices, especially the use of straitjackets or electroconvulsive therapy. Museums have an important role in challenging such misrepresentations by explaining the therapeutic purpose behind them, as well as acknowledging their adapted but continuing use. Yet they've sometimes exaggerated the distinctions between historical and contemporary theories and practices to make a firm break with the past. Amidst concerns over dark tourism, the idea of exploiting human suffering for entertainment, and the potential of some exhibits to fuel negative stereotypes and stigma, some museums avoid discussion of the ongoing use of techniques with negative associations or relegate discomforting objects to the outskirts of exhibitions or remove them to storage. Like most medical museum collections, the historical artifacts and archives of psychiatric museums primarily represent the practitioner view. And so art has become an increasingly dominant strategy to incorporate the perspectives of mental health service users, as well as to provide critical reflection on medical approaches. These are sometimes shown alongside oral histories or recordings of written accounts. These multimedia strategies have raised concerns among some curators and historians that the material culture of the history of psychiatry will be lost or endangered now it's fading out of favor for exhibition along with a push by scholars to acknowledge the research potential of such artifacts. The potential loss of significant me medical heritage is a risk, even for relatively recent histories. The material culture of HIV and AIDS, for example, has only been narrowly collected as its reuse in recent exhibitions has demonstrated. The three kinds of heritage saved are art, activist ephemera, and public health materials. They represent only some groups and reflect a limited array of activities in the history of the pandemic. Historians and curators have found the collections inadequate for analysis and exhibition as they fail to document the full impact of HIV and AIDS across diverse communities, nor the broad scope of local, national, and international action. In the Netherlands, valuable material has disappeared including a scrapbook of photographs and postcards from one of the country's first AIDS wards, as well as the first handwritten version of a guide to caring for someone with AIDS, which was used to train carers in the Dutch body system. All of this is problematic, not only because archives and museum collections fuel inaccurate perceptions of the past, but also because these histories feed into the trajectory of disease in the present. While academics and public health practitioners continue to debate the relevance of history for practice and policy, historical interpretations, whether carefully constructed or problematically framed and flawed, are already put to use in the management of health and illness. Although not always part of a conscious instrumentalization of the past, legacies, lessons, and myths shape healthcare, from the attitudes of patients to the assumptions of healthcare professionals and policymakers. We should be mindful then of the collections and interpretations housed in prestigious museums. In 2017, the Welcome Collection displayed Can Graphic Design Save Your Life? A temporary exhibition curated by designers. The exhibition delivered a mostly celebratory storyline, which implied that indeed it can. While the curators address the use of design to sell unhealthy behaviors, such as smoking through tobacco advertising, Overall, the exhibition narrative highlighted the power of imagery to persuade people to take actions for their own good and for wider public health. The exhibition also featured the UK Health Education Campaign, informally known as the Don't Die of Ignorance Project, after the main tagline of the television adverts and print materials. A brief label noted that the campaign was controversial, but highly memorable. A newspaper article promoting the opening of the exhibition included interviews with the government minister for health at the time of the campaign and one of the designers, both reflecting on its history. They commented on the difficulty of the project in the face of intense opposition and asserted that the menacing tone was necessary and successful. Yet 30 years since this campaign, historians, public health practitioners, 
and policymakers still disagree on its impact. Notorious for its use of fear, the adverts have been criticized for terrifying general audiences, potentially prejudicing them against those groups most at risk, and for serving as a public relations exercise for the government rather than a serious public health effort aimed at saving lives. But the politicians and graphic designers involved now claim it as an unqualified success and do so in a venue strongly associated with the cutting edge medical research funded by the Wellcome Trust. An overemphasis on visual culture can distract us from one of the most important lessons of the spread of HIV, the social determinants of health, which indicate that knowing how to protect oneself from infection is not enough. Risk factors for contracting the virus include inequality in sexual relationships, social and economic marginalization, mental health and addiction issues, low levels of education, a lack of access to services, or a safe place to live. All of these factors also contribute to the impact HIV infection will have on an individual's health and well-being. And these issues need to be addressed in any exhibition claiming to represent the history of AIDS. The limited heritage of AIDS is particularly surprising given that historians, curators, activists, and health professionals were aware of the historical significance of the new disease from the outset. My research suggests a range of reasons why materials weren't collected despite this awareness, including museums' lack of connections to marginalized groups and narrow perceptions of what counts as activism, which privileged spectacular street protests rather than backstage lobbying, for example. Museums also struggled with the difficulty of collecting the interrelated social, cultural, and scientific dimensions of the pandemic. As each institution traditionally focuses on a specific domain, such as scientific innovation or national history, they lack the mandate as well as the space to collect across these boundaries. The Rijksmuseum Bohava only recently added their first object related to this history with a piece of the Dutch AIDS memorial quilt, and they're currently expanding their collecting on this topic. The Bohava also drew on their collection to contribute to the response to the current pandemic of COVID-19, making an old mechanical ventilator available to researchers who use it as a working model to design a new easy to produce version for use today. And you can see both here. The historical artifact and the design prototype it inspired are now displayed in Infected, the museum's current exhibition originally intended to examine the risk of new epidemics, but which proved very timely given the global spread of COVID-19. The project is accompanied by a variety of events and resources and has attracted extensive media attention, as well as a steady stream of visitors. Such activities demonstrate how wrong it is to assume that a museum is a graveyard for the past, preserving only outdated technologies or techn techniques that are no longer useful. In fact, they house rich collections with potential uses we may not yet have even imagined. A large number of online platforms have been launched to capture the impact of COVID-19 across different groups. The surge in digital communication fueled by bans on travel, the closure of workplaces and educational institutions, and the call for people to stay home has made digital collecting a priority now that so much of life is lived online, as well as a necessity given these restrictions on movement and meeting up. The scale of stories that can be captured in this manner is impressive, and there's an array of projects targeting specific groups, such as students, healthcare workers, and people with disabilities. But unless this approach is supplemented by additional activities to collect objects, silences in histories will persist as they have for AIDS especially for groups without easy access to digital tools, including the elderly, as well as poorer people and those living in institutional settings, like care homes, prisons, and mental health facilities. This is an especially important issue, given that all of these groups face particular risks in this pandemic. While we could mine digital collections for ideas for objects to be accessioned by museums in the future, some may disappear before curators can reach them. Although museum staff are discussing collecting strategies, a heavy emphasis has been placed on ethical approaches, 
so as not to distract essential workers, in healthcare especially, from their core priorities, or to burden those dealing with grief. Yet in the midst of a crisis, materials that are no longer medically useful may be discarded, and more personal items may be dismissed as insignificant, rather than recognized for their historical value. A key strategy needed is the cultivation of historical consciousness to encourage people across different communities to see themselves as part of history in the making and to reach out to those groups likely to be underrepresented in other kinds of initiatives. These collections will form the basis of the histories we construct in the coming decades. AIDS powerfully demonstrated the interlocking social, economic, political, cultural and historical factors that shape individual risk, as well as the global management of infectious disease. And COVID-19 requires a similarly complex view. A focus only on the medical issues, highlighting the structure of the virus, the ways infections spread, and the timeline of discoveries made, would obscure aspects that help to explain other important dimensions, such as why some communities were harder hit, how contradictory information muddied health advice and fueled non-compliance, and how scientific conflict and cooperation has played out across countries. A social history emphasizing the range of community responses, such as banners supporting essential workers and pictures hung in windows to encourage positivity, might capture the most well-publicized activities, but misses less media-friendly efforts, those on a smaller scale, and the more distressing experiences of isolation and loss. If we assume that the scale of this crisis is large enough to ensure its preservation in the historical record and neglect the need to gather a broad range of materials to reflect the full diversity of its impact, the end result, as with HIV and AIDS, may be a narrow picture of the past with limited relevance for preparing for the future. My final question arises from looking at the range of medical heritage that has been collected. Some worry that certain objects are too controversial, disturbing, or prone to misinformation to be effectively repurposed. Curators have concerns, for example, about skulls or body parts collected in colonial projects and objects used to classify humans in racial hierarchies. Such items may be removed from display altogether or exhibited in a way that shields them from casual encounters, visible only through a deliberate act, such as turning on a light or by looking over or under a barrier. Some of these objects have been removed from display while stakeholders debate the ethics and significance of presenting them to the public. Subsequently forgotten about by researchers and museum visitors, such removals may put these objects at risk as declining use can lead to the defunding or destruction of collections. Yet I believe that it's crucial that this difficult heritage of medicine be shown. These objects generate some of the most intense reactions amongst audiences, often provoking productive discussions of important issues. For example, babies in bottles, as they're commonly known among staff and visitors, are some of the most controversial objects displayed in medical museums, but also some of the most popular. Part of the controversy surrounding them comes from the manner in which they were collected, often without the permission of the person whose body they were originally growing within. Although we know very little about the origins of most specimens, historians have found evidence both of doctors secretly keeping remains for their research use and of parents donating a dead embryo or fetus to their doctor specifically for preservation in a museum. An additional complication with their display arises from the very pronounced deformities evident in some fetuses. Discussions about whether these are suitable for general audiences focus on the possible responses generated whether viewers will react appropriately or with fear or revulsion, the potential distress they could cause, especially to pregnant women, and whether people with disabilities and other critics will see such exhibitions as a modern day freak show cloaking spurious entertainment in the guise of education. Curators I've met with often refer to the pressure they're under to remove such objects from display. This pressure often comes from marketing or educational staff who assume the items are too upsetting to show, despite the obvious interest of many visitors. Assumptions often couched as a concern for school-aged visitors 
are based on an adult sense of the diseases and deformities the materials may represent. In fact, youngsters are less likely to be distressed and more likely to be intrigued, as curatorial staff often report. Some have expressed concern, however, that for adolescent girls especially, such, such exhibits may negatively impact their views on having children by creating an exaggerated sense of the risks of pregnancy. This problem is, of course, exacerbated by the limited representation of pregnancy and childbirth in mass media, as well as broader cultural silence on reproductive health issues, including prenatal screening, abortion, and infertility. And although sex and the history of sexology is always a popular exhibition theme, reproduction, including infertility, pregnancy, pregnancy loss, abortion, or childbirth, is not. While they may seem like less fun topics than the history of research on sexual behavior, they're just as important in the lives of potential visitors. This paradox is also evident in wider society, where the sexualized female body is everywhere to be seen, from advertisements to art galleries, yet her reproducing body is barely visible. We rarely see graphic depictions of childbirth or realistic, non-romanticized representations of the physical changes involved in pregnancy and postpartum. Indeed, the most common materializations of pregnancy, even in medical museums, are human embryos and fetuses with women literally cut out of the picture in anatomical illustrations or in models detailing reproduction and childbirth. These might be shown alongside practitioner tools, such as forceps, again with women notably absent. Curators and tour guides report that all of these objects can generate affecting responses from visitors, especially women, who sometimes share their personal experiences with prenatal testing, having a miscarriage or a difficult birth, or raising a child with a disability. All of these issues are considerations familiar to parents and to people trying to conceive, yet they remain relatively private topics, marginalized in culture and public debate. The silence surrounding miscarriage is particularly problematic, given that 20% of known pregnancies end in pregnancy loss. Women who have terminated a pregnancy due to fetal abnormalities or experienced a miscarriage are also known to visit medical museums to learn more about a particular condition or as part of their grieving process. At one museum I visited, where there's an ongoing collaboration with genetics researchers, a doctor even advises pregnant women to view the fetal specimens while they wait for their results of prenatal testing. Yet even this very limited entry point to engaging with these issues is under threat as some museums remove such materials from display. Even curators who advocate showing such items acknowledge difficulties accompanying their policies. Firstly, of course, there are the problems associated with the display of unusual anatomies or deformities, creating an exaggerated sense of the risks of pregnancy in a culture of ableism, which undervalues and restricts the lives of people with disabilities. Secondly, some visitors may interpret fetal specimens through the lens of contemporary abortion po politics, but often without an understanding of the shifting landscape of health risks in the past, or the current complexities of prenatal testing. With critical disability scholars now discussing the new eugenics of contemporary medicine and public health policy, especially genetic testing, or the allocation of limited health resources as occurred during the peak of hospital admissions for COVID-19, for example, these collections offer valuable opportunities to provoke visitor curiosity and engage with these issues. In my view, the important role that these collections play in generating conversations and prompting reflection is underestimated by stakeholders who argue against their display. Instead, I advocate for the continued use of these collections, but crucially that they need to be shown alongside a much wider representation of the realities of human reproduction than is commonly seen. In fact, given the cultural silence on these issues, medical museums have a responsibility to address them. There's a growing call for more attention to women's reproductive health, to challenge stigma, abuse, and commercial profit influenced by ignorance and shame surrounding the female body. The topic has been so overlooked that medical museums often have very limited materials, however. As the Science Museum London recently realized, 
when reviewing their expansive holdings of more than 7 million objects. To address the underrepresentation of women's reproductive health there, they've now launched a new collecting project to gather artifacts and have asked the public for suggestions of possible items to include. There's also strong opposition to public displays about reproduction from some unlikely sources. The artists who created the Birthrights Project, currently displayed at King's College London, for example, have faced criticism from the obstetricians and gynecologists on campus who feel threatened by these displays, as they question, very gently in my opinion, the dominance of medicalized approaches to normal childbirth. Such objections at a site where future health professionals are trained indicate a damaging divide between practitioners and patients and between medical ways of viewing the world and other forms of knowledge that are also valuable for managing health, illness, and being human. Bridging such divides and putting medical heritage to use are the cornerstones of my vision for the future of medical and health humanities and the MA program and track that I'm coordinating here at the VU. Health humanities is the emerging term for approaches to health and medicine, which incorporate the methods and sources of media and cultural studies, history and the arts, formerly known as medical humanities. The replacement of medical with health is intended to convey the field's expansion beyond medicine to also include a wider array of caregivers as well as the perspectives of patients, and to acknowledge that for most health challenges, biomedical factors interact with social and cultural dimensions to determine who is most at risk and how their illness will be managed. As the current pandemic vividly illustrates, the progress of a virus through a continent, country, community, or within an individual is shaped by everything from cultural norms and national priorities to local services and family finances. While research funding and media attention swells around the search for effective vaccines, health humanities scholars are drawing attention to the wider range of responses that will be needed to increase public confidence in expert advice, to help policymakers sift between competing scientific conclusions, and to devise and test a diverse array of strategies to heal trauma ease loneliness and build resilience for future challenges. Such activities are examined in the VU curriculum with courses open to students enrolled in health sciences, medicine and pharmacy, social sciences and humanities programs, as well as to practitioners working in related fields. Teaching takes up the innovations emerging in medical museums to activate all the senses and highlight the role of smell, taste, sound and touch in gathering information and building knowledge. Sessions draw on a wide array of sources, including museum objects, archival documents, posters, songs, photographs, and films. The course Knowing by Sensing, led by Caro Verbeek, provides an introduction to sensory studies. Drawing on a team of collaborators, sessions train students' sensory gaze and teach them to use their senses analytically. Students learn how to put taste and smell into words, and experience how the senses can heighten the imagination, enhance knowledge, and help memorization. In the course Objects of Knowledge, which I teach in collaboration with museum curators, students learn through material culture. In object handling sessions and exercises curating a specific topic or collection, students learn how objects were used by their original owners, what they reveal about history that other sources may obscure, and how their collection and reuse shapes our understanding of the past, as well as contemporary approaches to health and medicine. My colleague Ab Flipser organizes a series of special lectures by leading researchers in medical history and the health humanities, where students can see how new methods are being used to uncover hidden histories and how humanities approaches can be useful for managing health and illness today. Curriculum materials and reports on the results of these activities will be made available on the Pulse Network website, where I'm aiming to build a broad community of experts and enthusiasts for this work. And I invite all of you to join the network to receive updates and share your own news of activities in this field. As I hope to have demonstrated today, medical heritage and medical history hold special potential to address topics of great importance and wide societal relevance, from illness and caregiving to gender and sexuality 
from bodily difference to mental health, and from emerging infectious diseases to medical technologies and public health policy. As museums reimagine the stories they can tell and the communities they can speak to, they're expanding notions of what counts as medical history, and so what should be collected, of who is interested in this past or should see it, as well as ideas about what audiences can gain from engaging with medical heritage. These collections offer a stunning array of provocative materials to attract diverse audiences and to bring people together to address some of the most significant issues across the life cycle. Medical heritage is valuable for historical research as well as for addressing contemporary issues and engaging with these collections can be of benefit to patients and users of healthcare services as well as to medical practitioners with the potential to uncover forgotten lessons of history, to generate novel collaborations between the disciplines, and to create new approaches to contemporary challenges, the health humanities have a crucial role to play in the future of health and medicine. It only remains for me to thank those involved in installing me in this professorship and supporting my work. Firstly, sincere thanks to the university and to the Stichting Historia Medicinae for creating this role and thanks to the University of Amsterdam for allowing me to take it up. I'm especially grateful to Inge Lehmans for her advice on my ideas and her energy and enthusiasm to put them into action. And to VU Fonds and the Comenius Teaching Fellowship for funding to develop new courses in medical and health humanities. My colleagues in the VU History Programme have been so welcoming and have provided crucial help as I've settled into my new role. My UFA colleagues, particularly Ruud Janssens, have been enthusiastic supporters of my activities, and I'm grateful to enjoy such a dynamic intellectual environment across both universities, especially in the networks of CLU+, ASH, and ARIAS. I'm also thankful for the wider community of scholars across the Netherlands working on the history of health and medicine, and my museum colleagues, especially Richard Sundell of Leicester University's Research Center for Museums and Galleries, Catherine Ott, curator at the National Museum of American History, and Elizabeth Fee and Patricia Tui of the National Library of Medicine, where I began my career as a public historian. The research I've presented here draws on four years of visits to medical museums across Europe and more than 15 years of thought-provoking conversations with the people caring for these incredible collections. I'd like to thank everyone who shared their insights along the way and acknowledge all of the museums who've provided me with the images shown here as well as a wealth of information about the challenges and rewards of exhibiting medical heritage. I've also been lucky to be involved in inspiring collaborations with various groups, including in the past Queering the Collections and currently the Bib Network for Disability History. And I look forward to the new plans emerging in the Historical College of Vey and Vayen, where we're working to bring history into nursing education and policymaking. I also appreciate the chance to exchange ideas and develop practical projects with such a broad range of students from different backgrounds and disciplines. Much of the learning we do together has taken us out of our comfort zones and into difficult topics, unfamiliar communities and challenging ways of working. I'm immensely proud of the accomplishments of past and present students and pleased to see so many of them taking a new interest in medical history and heritage out into the world. And I'd like to acknowledge three of my own teachers for their role in shaping my interests and approach. Richard Canning, who introduced me to the field of medical humanities with a course on AIDS literature when I was still an undergraduate. Roberta Bivins, who was one of my MA teachers and is still a source of useful advice and inspiration. And Sonia Michelle, a stellar dissertation supervisor and an exceptional role model for academic citizenship. Finally, I'm thankful to my family for the many years they indulged me as a perpetual student as I worked my way through different universities and degree programs, especially my mother who warned me to find a career I was really interested in given just how much of our time we spend at work. And finally, sincere thanks to my partner, Michael Austin, who's looked after our children and kept them happy while I've been so frequently away for research. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleague uh, Manan Perry. Uh, I would like to invite Inge Lehmans to come and give
kind of reply. We are looking forward to what you are going to see. Esteemed uh, Professor Perry, dear Manon, I'm so glad we finally made it. And at last, we have the opportunity to officially welcome you to the VU and to be informed and thrilled by your inaugural lecture. Due to COVID, we had to cancel the previously scheduled lecture in March. The last weeks have been rather thrilling, in another way, you might say, for we have been anxiously uh, monitoring the constantly shifting health situation in our country and the consequential shifting in regulations in our universities. Especially over the last few days, time seemed to be slowing down as we constantly had to adapt to new rules and challenges. Um, and I think that in these challenging times, we again got to know uh, know you as an extremely committed and flexible scholar and organizer with a sharp eye for public health issues and social sensitivities. In the end, you might say this hybrid form might even be better suited to you as a scholar, since it provides us with the opportunity to present the inaugural lecture to your extensive national and international network, thus helping to further shape the community for medical and health humanities. It is with great pleasure and with honor that today, on behalf of the Vrije Universiteit and the Stichting Historia Medicine, which supports this chair, I can take the opportunity to sing your praises and underline the strategic importance of your chair to our research community and educational programs. The pandemic and its consequences, as you have already stated in your lecture, show the urgency of, health of the health humanities domain. You've also explained this in recent interviews and newspaper articles and in blog posts in your uh, Pulse network. Um, the COVID crisis, as you said, not only urges virologists and other medical professionals to share and expand their knowledge, it also requires domain knowledge from the humanities. Medical history and its archive of evidence can help by teaching us how others have coped with, pa with past epidemics and how these can trigger anxieties and panic. Media studies can show us how media are framing matters. Our newly installed language and communication professor, Hedwig de Molde, for instance, just gave an interview about Mark Rutte's communication strategies. Our literature and philosophy department, departments study illness uh, narratives. Our sensory study experts at the VU um, study how corona causes both smell loss and olfactory gain. That's as lock in lockdown, we experience new smell sensations. These are just a few examples that not only highlight the urgency of health humanity, humanities approaches, they also indicate how your chair at the VU is eagerly awaited, as it helps to further the interdisciplinary health humanities expertise of the university. Today, you have shown us how medical heritage and medical museums can play a major role in society by contributing to health and well-being. You have stressed the importance of medical heritage for understanding history, but also in addressing contemporary public health problems, bridging the gap between practitioners and patients and between medical science and other forms of knowledge and sense making. This urgent research program strengthens the heritage and history of knowledge and the history of knowledge expert groups of our interfacultary research institute, CLU+. Since your chair was inaugurated, you have explored possible connections to the VU research community, setting up collaborations with VMC and its educational program in medical philosophy and ethics and with disability studies. From the start of your installation as a professor at the VU, we, and I really do speak here with the voices of all the members of the curatorium, have been really impressed by your ambitions, your nearly unstoppable enthusiasm, your excellent communication skills, always looking two steps ahead 
adding new perspe perspectives and always emphatic with people's sensitivities or domain-specific expectations. These qualities are not only compelling, they are a great asset in a research domain which has an esteemed tradition, medical history, and is now quickly rejuvenating and expanding. The field consists of many different blood groups. No wonder you have called the newly installed network Pulse Network. Underlining the necessity, I think, to, bridge all, to bring all bloodlines together, to take pulse of society and to give research and education fresh impulses. This new impulse has resulted, resulted in a total makeover, we just saw it, of the MA track Medische Geschiedenis into Medical and Health Humanities Programme. Already in your first year, in the first year of your appointment here, you have acquired funding to support this makeover and to develop innovative teaching and knowledge strategies. Together with disability studies and the secondary education team of the VU, you are investigating how embodied learning strategies can be helpful for interdisciplinary and international classrooms. And for this, you have engaged a large network of scholars and cultural heritage institutes. It's really hard to keep up with Manon and all her activities. And most of the times when I call you, you're on the road somewhere, meeting people, set up new, setting up new collaborations, such for instance, the Housing Gas Institute Working Group HHH, or visiting medical collections all over the world. Students recognize your expertise and profit from your energy, your network, and your committed help to pursue careers in academics or in cultural heritage to publish their findings and so on. Professor Perry, I could go on and on, but I have to conclude, alas. On behalf of the university, our faculty, and of the Department of History, a warm welcome. We are looking forward to a pulsating future. I really like the pulsating future idea. Thank you. Uh, thanks for re responding to Manon Perry. Manon, thank you very much for your inaugural lecture. We now arrive at the end of this meeting, uh, virtual physical meeting. Um, so we will leave this all in a corona proof order which is easy uh, i think and um in order to close this public meeting of the college van decane i would like to uh, pronounce the doxology and i would like to ask you to stand May the name of the Lord be blessed from now to eternity.